I want to make an example about some SOEs, like your PIC, your land bank. Those are SOEs that are functioning well, that are serving um, their purpose. Um, your PIC is um, um, serving its purpose. No, it's not discriminatory laws, mm -hmm. but it is laws that are there to correct the wrongs of the past. But they still, um, you, you correcting discrimination with other discrimination? Parliament must on its own find time and space to implement and discuss the implementation of the recommendations of the Zondo Commission. Welcome to the State of the Nation. State of the Nation is uh, in proud partnership with Pace Car Rental. And the very big news is that you, as somebody that is watching this, can go onto the Pace Car Rental website and get a discount by using the code SONA, S-O-N-A. So we are not only bringing you great content, we also bring you discounts on car rental. So please do that. But you do know that you've come to the State of the Nation because you want to find out more about the South African political landscape. And we're doing this by interviewing many of the leaders of the prominent parties. And today I'm very excited to have somebody we haven't spoken to before. And that is Mr. Voya Zungula from the African Transformation Movement. We are welcome to the State of the Nation. It's great thank to you. have you here. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, no, it's, it's brilliant because yo, you make a lot of noise. Eh? <laughs> you have been quite prominent in Parliament. Yeah. You have, uh, have really driven the Palapala Pala story most, uh, most notably. Mm. Uh, I'm sure that uh, last Christmas you didn't get a a card from President Ramaphosa, is that about right? Yeah, I think he only sent to his friends. Yeah, yeah, I know who he didn't send to. So, yeah, certainly uh, the kind of parliamentarian that, uh, that South Africa needs, somebody who's there to hold people to account. But before we get into the politics of it all and, and the party itself, I want to go back a step, yeah. which is the formation of your party, which happened in 2019, just ahead of the election, the last, the previous uh, general election. And uh, the big mouthpiece behind uh, ATM at that point, it seemed certainly from the media stories, was uh, Mzwaneli Manye, mm. Jimmy Manye, yeah. right? Who was certainly uh, looked like he was very much part of your mm. of your organisation, mm. uh, and then just sort of melted away and reappeared as an EFF uh, um, parliamentarian, mm. right? W tell me about. ATM. How did it come about and why ATM? Yeah. Weren't you concentrating when you had ATM, <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. So the party was formed in 2018. Um, we got our certificate of registration 20 June 2018. Um, and it was basically through the formation, um, through the coming together of different churches, royal houses, community organizations who wanted to impact change on our country. Now, I think because of how our media is structured, it's very sensa sensational. Um, they like clickbaits, they like sound bites. Now, but to be to... fair, uh, Mr. Manya hasn't found a microphone he hasn't liked. <laughs> eh? So yeah. So come 2019 now. By the time Mr. Manya joins, we have already launched our manifesto. We have um, did all of our election structures. We have. Um, even submitted, um, I think we're close to finalizing our election list for um, that particular election. Now, I think what media did not comprehend is how an unknown young person, which is myself, becoming a president of the party, because for them, politics is all about being sensational. So that is, I think, why they decided to focus on him in terms of his background, what he stands for, instead of wanting to understand where the party is coming from, where is it funded by, um, you know, and everything concerning the party. I remember one publication got it so wrong to an extent of even calling me a former DA leader. <laughs> um, so that is how our media is sensational in the sense that they get things wrong either deliberately or because of ignorance. So I think that is what um, transpired during those um, between when we were formed and the general election of 2019. And then another link that was made was a link with, at that point, the recently ousted President uh, Jacob Zuma. Yeah, there was a link with Mr. Zuma. There was a link with Isma Khashule. Again, it was precisely because the manner in which our politics is structured, the, the media and the people don't understand how a party with no links in politics, with politicians or political party, 
out of nowhere just pops up and you know has got widespread support amongst the people to an extent whereby when they made those allegations that Mr. Zuma, Mr. Mahashule were involved since 2018 or 2019 up until this day not even a single shred of evidence they provided even though the ANC had their own commission of inquiry that was done led by um, Dr. Frin Chinwala and um, Khalema Motlante, they actually found that none of the ANC people are involved in the formation um, and the existence of the ATM. The media could not respond to that um, or write about that because it would have shown that they, were, they actually got it wrong. So there's been so much that has been said about the ATM, um, but what we've managed to do is to stay true to who we are, stand firm on what we believe in and advocate um, for things that are in the best interest of the people. Okay, so no link with uh, President Zuma. Uh, Jimmy Manya come and gone. Yeah. Happily in red mm. and taking instructions. So that that's all dealt with. And uh, you get two seats in Parliament and you made them count. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, I think, again, what many opposition parties, especially if you've got one or two seats, um, the mistake they made um, they make is that they just want to get into parliament and just want to um, you know blow with the wind if the wind is swinging in one direction especially uh, when it comes to issues um, concerning um, the abuse of power or corruption they are not bold enough to actually stand firm in what they believe in so with us as the ATM we believe that even if there's two of us if something is um, we are standing on the truth, regardless whether the entire 398 members of parliament are sitting on the opposite end, we are going to stand firm in what we believe in. So that is how um, we managed to sustain dealing with the bread and butter issues um, that we've, um, we've spoken about in parliament since 2019 and issues concerning um, abuse of power like um, Palapan. And uh just to go back to your 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 party structure, are you particularly strong in any? Where's your biggest support base? Um, the biggest support base is the Eastern Cape, followed by KZN, then Pumalanga. You've got um, Gauteng coming mm. right after. So that is where we've got the biggest number of supporters as a party. And in the local uh, elections. Local elections, we got 55 seats, if I'm not mistaken. We Out of those 55 seats, we've got a speaker in Swan, we've got a mayor, Mokale City, MMCs um, across Free State, in Gauteng, and some parts of Mpumalanga. So with many um, other parties have managed to um, find confidence in us. That is why they're able to elect ATM representatives in these positions. And you've been, you've had coalitions on both sides of the aisle, if we could put it that way. We don't have necessarily coalitions as a party because yes. there's no written binding agreement between us and other parties because we believe that there needs to be like a program of action. If a party comes to us and say, okay, we're going to vote for you to be a mayor in Mohale, these are the key priorities. And when we look at those priorities, it is what we also believe in. So we um, would agree that they would vote for an ATM mayor. But when it comes to binding documents between parties, we don't have such. But that uh, mayorship in, uh, in uh, um, Mughali City, that was at the expense of the multi-party charter coalition, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but we are not part of the multi-party charter. Yeah, you're part of the uh, organization that dislodged them. If, is that correct? No, no, we're not part of any organization that dislodged yes. them because we, as a party, were not in any collision with um, either the ANC or the EFF or the PAC or the DA with the multi-party charter. We're just a standalone organization who will vote um, depending on the circumstances and what is in the best interest of the people in um, the different uh, municipalities. Yeah, because it's assumed, the, the, once again, going back to the media, and that's yeah. why I thought it'd be great to get you on here. Yeah. It's kind of assumed that you would be in the, the and I think this goes back to the, the reported link with President Zuma back mm -hmm. in those days, that there'd be an automatic uh, link between ATM and the EFF and the ANC, but mm. that's not the case. No, definitely not the case. We don't have any formal working arrangement with them. Even when there's a question asked um, about if 29 May comes and there needs to be a coalition government, we are also very clear on that to say any coalition government must be based on what is a program of action. 
um, a program of action that is people-centered, that is going to deal with the live realities of the people and solve our problems. Not a program of action to say these parties have clubbed together for the sake of clubbing together. And then what needs to be done in best interest of the people comes um, as an afterthought. For us, what becomes primary is what needs to be done. Then once we decide on what needs to be done and we've got alignment in terms of the parties, then the second question is to who then becomes the lead of you know this program? Who gets to play a certain role in terms of the ministerial positions or in terms of being presiding officers in parliament? Not the other way around, whereby you start with the positions and then you end off by discussing what needs to be done. Yeah. Now, okay, so let's go straight into into some of the policies. Yeah. Of, uh, of uh, the ATM. Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the real issues that matter in South Africa because obviously South Africa is sitting with multiple crises mm. at the moment and uh, all roads lead to Rome. Most of the crises have happened as a result of poor and mismanagement by the ruling party. Mm. Um, they have their own, they almost two parties because they're constantly fighting against each other internally. Um, what what changes would an ATM government bring to South Africa? Yeah, you know, when you're looking at the, the, the challenges that we face in the country, it is our view that if you are going to have a country with the highest unemployment rate, most unequal society, highest crime rate, and all of the crises like you've just alluded to, there needs to be fundamental changes. Many parties, they just want to make cosmetic changes. And in, in our view, you can't make cosmetic changes in light of how dire the situation is in our country. That is why from an economic point of view, we are very, very adamant on the economy must be transformed so that it does not circulate. We don't have an economy that is centered around very few players very few families and you do not have widespread mass participation of citizens in the economy. That is why one of our proposals is to say 50% of government spending must go to SMMEs because firstly SMMEs are the biggest creators of jobs that is known all over the world. Secondly, currently the government is spending 80% of its over 2.5 trillion um, rent budget per annum on big companies. And SMMEs and cooperatives are only scrambling for less than 20%. Secondly, we are advocating that there must be local production of basic goods and services and basic goods because we've got a case in our country whereby there are factories, which is a physical infrastructure. If you go to Dimbaza in the Eastern Cape or Butterworth or you go to Kwakwa, Bronkon Sprait, many districts, there are those physical infrastructure factories. There is a demand because on a daily basis, go to any township, People are using soap, they are using toothpaste, they are using these goods on a daily basis. Now, what we're answering now is the ATM. Let's have now the government playing a critical role in terms of investing in factories that are producing these goods and services so that we create jobs because factories naturally create jobs. And secondly, they are going to ensure that money circulates um, amongst those different communities. Because if you go to Ekzoa, I remember when I was growing up, there was the shop um, um, Pep. Pep had a factory M Sobomvu, where in my township where I used to live in. So, and the people that were working in Pep were the people that were staying in the townships. So that is how jobs were created. But come to how the economy is now, we are importing even toothpicks, we are importing sneakers from China, umbrellas from the UK. In our view, we should be producing goods. And the reason why I'm saying in the different districts, it is because if you are going to have an economy how it is now, whereby um, bulk of the economic activities are in Gauteng, KZN and Western Cape, or, which is Cape Town, you have that mass migration of people from the outskirts of the country coming to Gauteng in search of economic opportunities. Whereas once you create economic opportunities in the different localities, then it's going to enable people to make a living and have economic opportunities where they are. Um, and then that is going to stimulate the economy is going to reduce the burden on Gauteng that has to cope with so many people coming from or virtually all nine provinces. And most importantly, it's going to create diverse players in the economy because our economy um, is structured in a manner whereby there's monopolies and oligopolies. If I can ask you now, banking industry, 
um, how many companies or banks are there, commercial banks? You won't reach seven. Go to the telecommunications. You won't reach seven um, companies in that space. And that is the reason why our economy is not um, opened up to a manner that is allowing citizens to participate and participate meaningfully. And the last one on this issue is the question of agriculture, where we view that agriculture is so important, especially when it comes to food security. And food security must not be anchored on a few farmers. Food security must be anchored on the citizens themselves. There's so much arable land in our country. There's so many high, um, high unemployment, meaning what we need to do is to say to the government, invest in people in farming um, all over the country, whereby we've got a policy that is saying one household, one garden, or one household, one farm, whereby even if you've got a piece of land where you are, you must be encouraged to farm, and the government must give you the resources for you to farm so that there is, um, we've got um, strength when it comes to food security. And the emerging farmers that are there in the different localities, if you go to um, a small town such as Velkom in the Free State, 50% of whatever produce that is sold by Pick and Pay, ShopRite or Boxer must be coming from the emerging farmers from that locality. Instead of a few farmers um, dominating our food supply, um, so that is what we are advocating for when it comes to agriculture. That will actually diversify again the players that are there in the economy because at the crux of our problems, there's very few players or suppliers who are supplying either goods or services across all of the industry. So that is why our interventions are centered around how do we decentralize the player so that South Africa is not just a consuming um, country. The people of our country are not just consuming whereby whatever they eat, they bought from someone. Whatever they eat, they, sorry, they wear, they bought from someone. Whatever they use, they bought from someone. But let's have a culture and a country whereby it is encouraging the production of um, you know, a, a country that is encouraging production to enable South Africans to actually consume what they produce instead of a country whereby citizens are just consuming whatever has been con um, produced by other people. Well, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Those are wonderful uh, ideas and you got my support 100%. Mm. Uh, there was, however, um, one word that kept on coming up there that troubles me. Okay. And that is government, mm. right? Do you really see the government as being the best people? They're the ones that got us into this mess. They're the ones that keep those monopoly, monopolies going. Yeah. And the, surely the enemy is red tape, not government. Mm. Do we want the government making all the decisions or, uh, you know, 60 million South Africans? Yeah, the government must play a critical role when it comes to building state capacity and dealing with the problems that are faced by our people. And the government in its entirety is not completely wrong or has not completely failed. I want to make an example about some SOEs like your PIC, your land bank. Those are SOEs that are functioning well, that are serving um, their purpose. Um, your PIC is um, um, serving its purpose. I think um, perhaps you're a couple of scandals behind because both of them have had massive scandals and the land bank had to be ba bailed out. No, if you look at now the functioning of these entities as compared, for example, to ESCOM, yeah. to, to oh. Post Office, they are doing quite well. And for us, critically, what needs to be understood is that the state in, um, in its conceptual form is not the problem. The problem is the people that are in the state, which is now the ANC um, politicians and the ANC appointed people who are not um, acting in the best interests of the people. So the government in its entirety, or the government as a concept, must be the ones that are given this. In fact, they must be the ones that are leading the responsibility of providing a better life for, for citizens. However, let's get rid now of the, these bad apples that, are, um, that have caused so much dysfunctionality and failure in terms of our state. So that is why it's important when people vote come 20, the 29th of May, they need to take into account that government as a concept, government as a, as a, as a state is not wrong. What is wrong or what needs to be corrected is the people that are presiding over the government that have led to all of this failure. Okay, so let's go back. You you, you said you know some wonderful things about uh, a lot of self-reliance, the, the, the sort of reindustrialization of South Africa. 
um, spreading out uh, the uh, agriculture, which is obviously um, an opportunity for South Africa. We've got lots of opportunity there. Uh, where do you stand? Where does your party stand on land ownership? Yeah, there must the government must be um, capacitated via the constitution to expropriate land without compensation because um, you can't have a case whereby majority of the land is in, in the hands of the white minority and majority of the citizens are scrambling for a very, very, um, you know, few hectares of land. When it are comes you to saying that the government doesn't have land that it could uh, that it could capacitate people with? We're saying that over and above what the government has failed on one, the first thing that the government has failed on is to utilize the existing land to provide um, housing um, for, for the people, agriculture for people, and using that land for productive purposes. So the government has got it wrong there. But at the same time, the land ownership, when it comes to how much land is owned by the white minority and how much land is in the hands of the African majority, there's so much um, you know, injustice in, in the sense that if more than 80% of the land is in the hands of the white minority. But that's not true. I mean, so, that, that, that's then saying that uh, state land is in the hand of, of white min minority. That 80% number is a complete and utter lie, isn't it? No, based on the reports that no, have that, been that done. That report is, is based on a 30-year report and it's not on owned land. It's on all land and it's still taking government land as if it's white owned. So, you know, I'm just saying that uh, this is an issue that, that obviously you're not going to get that growth or internal or external investment if you do not have secure property rights. It's just not going to happen. You wouldn't build up a nice farm if you knew that the government could take it away from you tomorrow. Yeah. No, the question of land expropriation without compensation is not a case whereby you just wake up and you take land willy-nilly like it has been done in other countries. But how, how do you protect against that? In our view you need to correct the wrongs of the past. If a person got land by the killing and the brutal murder of people, there needs to be justice. We can't run away from that fact. Right. However, if a person rightfully acquired land by purchasing land, paid for the land, mm. then that person cannot, um, you can, you cannot just wake up now and want to take that land, whereas a person actually, um, you know, paid for the land and followed um, the normal processes when it comes to the acquisition of okay. the land. So if I bought the farm in 1987, legally, yeah. I've got the documents, I'm fine. I keep that land. Yeah, if you bought the land, yes. um, you know, um, everything was done legally yes. and above board. In our view, um, there's, there's nothing that needs to be corrected. The there. government then couldn't mm. expropriate my yes. land. But if a person is a recipient of a land that was gotten through um, you know, um, l um, you know, land disposition mm. and, you know, um, the brutal murder of our people, surely we need to correct all of those. Wrongs. Yes, um, all I'm saying is that if we're going to then say only land that was purchased, you know, we've got records now that go back 150 years, all that land is purchased. Do you know what I mean? You're going to find little pockets, we know, because there have there've, there've been cases of land that was taken as recently as the 70s and 80s. But what I'm saying is that I'm quite confused by this because... Ultimately, what ends up happening? Do you set up some department that's meant to be ethical in the distribution of land? It, it becomes a nightmare. And I'm not saying that, uh, that uh, nothing should be done about mm -hmm. it, but I'm just very curious to know whether land rights are protected or not. Mm. Land rights are definitely protected. So they're protected, mm. but maybe not. No, they're definitely protected. But in the context of saying if a person um, got the land via illegal means, then obviously there needs to be justice. Because for us, you can't protect something. Now, that, that was, statute exists already, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, There's been land yeah. claims courts for the last 30 years. Yeah, you can't protect land that has been gotten through illegal means. Exactly. So that is the, the basis of the question of land expropriation without compensation. It is mm. a question of justice. It is a question, again, of saying that the manner in which it must be done. So that is why when we're talking about the question of land expropriation without compensation, we're also saying that the point of departure from the government now, the constitution, um, there's a lot of back and forth when it comes to amending section 25, and there's a lot of unhappiness. Nothing is stopping the government now yeah. from developing what they currently have ownership on um, when it comes to developing, making um, land available for the mm -hmm. citizens, providing world-class living accommodation 
for the people and providing farms for the people so that yes. you know you you scale up as many people as possible mm. whilst you are dealing with this sensitive issue um but at the same time you can't now have a government that will say the land question in south africa is going to be sorted on a singular day whereby the constitution is going to be amended in our view st- the government must start with um uh, with the land that is under their control and doing all of these things that that, that I've mentioned because you see I, I mean this this sort of reminds me of a situation that I had recently when I interviewed Gaten McKenzie yeah who says that uh, under patriotic alliance government they'll uh, suspend the constitution hang people do all sorts of things and then on the other hand tells me what a wonderful job he did at, as mayor of central kuru and I asked him if he needed to change a constitution to do a, a great job mm-hmm. and he said no he just needed to do a great job so i i'm sort of saying a similar thing about land you know there's a red herring here we're talking about amending the constitution mm. when the current um when the current laws have not been applied mm. right where mismanagement the any land that was gained uh, incorrectly we've had land claims throughout the the the, the new south africa and it, it exists and it should exist Yeah. So uh, you know all I'm saying is while this argument rumbles on mm. all it does is it makes investors uh, increasingly nervous it makes South Africans increasingly nervous because you don't have the certainty. Yeah. Uh so why pursue it mm. is is really what I'm saying because the problem yeah isn't the law the mm. problem is the implementation of current laws. Yeah. No I think what needs to be for uh for the investors to realize is that Um, you know south africans must fight for justice and correct whatever wrongs that happened in the past any investor that wants now south africans to ignore the injustices of the past then it's a, an investor not worth, worth having because we can't have an investor that wants well, to be part of um, you know encouraging now with the best respects let's just say i'm an i'm a potential investor that wants to invest in south africa yeah i'm looking at a country that um, that that's been in its current form for 30 years mm. and you're saying that i must come in and understand that maybe we haven't done anything for the last 30 years and we feel like doing it now that seems to be quite unfair an expectation to put on any investor be it domestic or foreign mm. to say well you know we'll get to it eventually but in the meantime we may throw your world upside down those investors need certainty that's yeah. that's why they invest in places with certainty and do not invest in places yeah. without it that's why the failure of this gov- current government is on the question of policy certainty and communicating to say i don't this think is, so surely yeah. the problem with this government is implementation this is um, the government should say this is what the problem is in terms of the injustices this is how we're going to correct it that will give the investor um, confidence to know okay there's certainty here but on the question of the failures of the government here we're dealing with a government that has failed in dealing with crime dealing with the land issue dealing with the economy now surely when we as a party are saying that we are not going to shy away from correcting even the wrongs of this current government because we are not part of the 30 years of the mismanagement of the country so that is why in our view we communicate clearly and with clarity to say this is what's going to happen so that investors are having a clear understanding of what is going to happen when it comes to land ownership in our country however with us being um, saying that utilizing the existing land that is in the hands of the government and not just willy-nilly taking land like it happened in other countries that should give whoever that is an investor confidence to say the intentions of these people is not to just to distract the country or destroy the country but the intention is to um correct the wrongs of the past and at the same time approaching the manner in a approaching the issue in a manner that is um um you know leading to self reliance and taking lessons from how the other countries got it wrong when it comes to dealing with the issue so you're saying it's a, it's like going into a meeting uh, the the difference is you're saying you're not going to carry the gun you're just going to keep it in your holster just in case you need to use it no it's not a gun the question of land it's not a gun that is there to harm people but it is um you know an instrument of justice to make sure that the wrongs of the past are corrected even the structure of the land ownership in the country does reflect the african majority but most importantly in our view investors must not look at the failures of the current government when it comes to how they manage the economy manage the land and then they think because the reason why we've got so many problems in our country the root causes of that 
is how the presiding officers of our country, which is the leaders of the ANC, have done all of this mismanagement. Whereas had the ANC leaders done what is, um, like you said, that they've enforced some of the existing laws, would not be where we are now. But mm -hmm. when it comes to the principle, justice not needs to be, um, we need to have justice on the question of the land issue. Okay, so let's move uh, to probably the bigger part of our employment solution lies in industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, taking on more industrial capacity, uh, tourism, there's a whole host of things that provide an even greater potential um, uh, employment boost than, you know, the land sometimes in, in scheme of the numbers. We understand that it's an uh, emotional issue, but it's not where the jobs lie. The jobs lie in other parts of the economy. What would you do differently to what the ANC are doing around uh, you know, the, the general economy. Yeah, I think um, rightfully, like you've stated, that we've got laws in our country, but what is lacking at the crux of it is the lack of the implementation of the laws. Um, I want to make a law, um, an example about the, the labor law, labor and immigration laws, for example, whereby it's very clear to say you only employ a non-South African citizen only when you can't find a South African citizen that can do the work. And when you employ a foreigner, there needs to be a skills transfer program, um, you know, and within um, a certain period of time, whatever skill that we did not have as a country, that skill must be transferred to a local. When you look at the implementation thereof, you know, there's no implementation. You don't have the labor inspectors, they only respond to whenever there's a, a big scandal that is happening or a big expose. We don't have a culture whereby the government is actually holding the private sector accountable when it comes to the enforcement of laws. So I think the point of departure from our view, um, um, uh, um, enforce the existing laws and once you um, enforce the existing laws, there's going to be positive changes when it comes to the economy. More people are going to be having jo um, jobs. And after the laws have been enforced, then you fill in the gaps on the question of the 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 uh, um, question of ensuring that 50% of government spending goes towards SMMEs, the um, um, reindustrialization, and other mechanisms. But critically, the point of departure enforce the existing laws. And uh, and some of the other sort of laws that have uh, crept into business, um, BE, uh, affirmative action, etc. cetera, um, do you believe that these uh, should be strengthened, um, done away with? Mm -hmm. We've seen people all sides of the spectrum in this election. Yeah, Where I does the ATM stand? The, those laws need to be kept and strengthened. Um, because the laws when it comes to dealing with the injustices of the past, because those laws are specifically done to, you know, to correct what um, is wrong in the past, um, was done wrong in the past. However, what people focus on is now on the corruption of the ANC and how the ANC is um, applying these laws, not in the best interest of the people, but in the interest of whoever that is politically connected. So our view as the ATM deal with what is wrong with the law, but don't destroy um, or um, take away the entire principle of the law of what wanting to achieve, which is to correct the injustices of the past, because we've seen how the workplace um, previously, it was always, um, you, we'd go to a company whereby the management is going to be 100% white male. But you find that through now the enforcement of these laws, there has been systematic changes. So there has been positives to be spoken about, affirmative action and BE. However, a lot of people want to focus on when the ANC does, um, you know, their shenanigans on the side. We are saying as the ATM, deal with the wrongs of the ANC, but don't take away the principle of wanting South Africa in terms of the workplace to be more inclusive and more representative of the, the current state of our country. And let's say you come in, correct the wrongs of the uh, ANC, do this wonderfully efficiently. When do you stop? What do you mean? Do when, you when do you stop with the discriminatory laws or do they just stay on the books forever? No, it's not discriminatory laws, mm -hmm. but it is laws that are there to correct the wrongs of the past. But they still, um, you, you correcting discrimination with other discrimination? It's not discrimination. It um, of course, for example, now you have cases whereby the, there's been an investigation that a report that was actually done on how there are some companies with um, discriminatory practices against the African majority. So with the existence of laws such as affirmative action and BE, 
you are able now to hold the whatever companies accountable for whatever practices that they are doing in those respective um, companies. And if you are to talk about justice or wanting South Africa to be an equal society, there are cases whereby um, I can even tell you my own personal story whereby I worked in a company with so much experience and I was given a salary of 6,000, whereas a white junior a male which was less experienced than me because he was white, he was earning 11,000. Surely the government needs to be capacitated to deal with such, um, you know, with such practices that are done. So that is why when you're talking about the question of the laws, laws are not done in our understanding as a means of punishing people, but laws are done, should be done as a means of leading South Africa to be more inclusive when it comes to the economic opportunities and the treatment of all people when it comes to um, the, the workplace and their opportunities in the economy. Okay, so moving on then from the economy, because roughly what you what I see on the on the land and the econom economic side is. Uh, we're going to keep everything the same, we're just going to do it better. What we're going to do is that we're going to take all of the progressive laws that are mismanaged or lack, um, there's lack of implementation by the ruling party, they are, must be implemented, there's going to be tangible changes. And as the changes occur and we're seeing tangible changes when it comes to the effect on the economy, on the people, then slowly you move away because, what, because we can't get to a state whereby there's equality but you still keep the laws that uh, um, um, that would give an impression that, um, you know, in, um, um, different, um, 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 there's inequalities that are proposed by the very same laws. Okay, so there's like a sunset clause at some point. At One, some point. Uh, yeah, at, at some point, for example, if you're talking about whatever that is there in terms of the law, you are making laws in South Africa because of the nature of our past. Obviously, when you reach a certain level or a certain stage whereby the wrongs of the past have been corrected, obviously you need to sit down because the laws in our view, including the constitution, we must not have constitutions or laws that one would appear as if they are cast in stone, but we need to continually review the laws in light of whatever is a reality at that point would in that time. Would that be enshrined in law? Yeah, definitely. Even the constitution now does stipulate that the constitution can be amended. So at some point... The elders will get together and say, guys, we can start, we'll change this percentage to that percentage. It's not even about the elders, about the South African citizens, because the South African citizens, in our view, they need to be masters of their own fate. When they see that the country has moved towards a certain direction and there's been wins, um, um, wins that um, have been made by the country, obviously they need now South Africans to say, okay, we don't need this law because this law was there to address a certain problem. This problem has been addressed now, so we can't we can't keep a law that was um, promulgated to address a problem, and the problem is no longer there. But we keep the law. Okay, so let's uh, talk about uh, safety and security. Clearly, um, our current minister of police has checked out. He only arrives on the scene like a like a, a, a police detective, um, but we seem to have no policing. We currently have about thirty thousand murders in South Africa every year. Gender-based violence is, is shameful. What would the ATM do uh, about safety and security in South Africa? Yeah, the first thing is to invest in the employment of all of the police reserves so that the ratio of police to citizen is in line with the UN re um, recommended, um, um, recommendation. Secondly, you invest in terms of training the policemen when it comes to um, dealing with the cases, um, investigating, dealing with the evidence. Because out of the 30,000 matters that we have roughly on a yearly basis, I think less than 3,000, there's actual pro um, prosecution and conviction, meaning the 27,000 people um, that are murdered, there's no justice for them. So that is where, in our view, we're getting things wrong, whereby the murders that are there, though they are not solved, so that is why you want to increase, firstly, the police, when it comes to police visibility, and there must be adequate training so that um, the police are not bungling cases, they are not there, you know, just operating and just um, existing, but their work must lead to eventual catching of the perpetrators and the effective sentencing of the perpetrators. And linked to that is the question of, again, working with community policing forums. So that, because the policy, uh, community policing forums, it is what the communities are doing. So in our view, the government needs to avail resources 
um, when it comes to supporting those organi um, um, policing forums because if you go to any community, if there's a break-in, you find that the people themselves are most likely to know who was the person that did the break-in. And also linked to this when it comes to dealing with the question of crime is the question of paying the police well so that there is no incentive for them to be in the, um, you know, in the, in, under the influence of criminals. But critically, you need to have very, very harsh sentences. That is why our manifesto is very clear to say, if you're a policeman or immigration officer or you occupy public office, immediately you are caught in corruption and you abuse your office. There needs to be, uh, you need to, the, the sentence that you need to receive is a life sentence without the possibility of parole, precisely because there's so much trust that has been given unto you. And once you abuse that trust, you are um, driving South Africa towards being a failed state because we go to some communities, they don't have trust with the police because some of the police are in cohorts with um, some of the criminals. So that is why it becomes important that in our view, there needs to be very harsh sentences on all of the public officials and policemen, immigration officers that are um, you know, that are involved in criminal doings. And you need again to, um, you know, have a country whereby citizens themselves are encouraged to a law-abiding culture and so that they despise um, and the breaking of the law. So for us, it is something that is, um, um, you know, it, it is broader um, proposals, including the question of, you've got cases in our country whereby there's heinous crimes and extenuating circumstances that when you rightfully think there needs to be a death penalty, because you can't have a case whereby 14 people in Soweto were murdered in one sitting, and those two or three people that actually did the murdering of 14 people um, are, are just going to be taken to prison, they're going to be given so many years, and then later on you find that after X number of years they go out on parole. So we are proposing as an ATM, wherever there's extenuating circumstances for heinous crimes, the appropriate sentence must be the, 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 the death penalty. I know a lot of people say, but the Constitution says this. Our view, again, the Constitution is not cast in stone. Secondly, when the death penalty was abolished in the 90s, do your research, it will tell you that there was a public outcry. And it was not a public outcry of a certain group of people. The entire country was saying, but this is wrong. In our view, that on its own is clearly showing that we've got a country that is led by 400 people, which is members of parliament or the very few um, party bosses of the ruling party that want to impose their will of them on the majority of our people. That is why on the question of the death penalty, we wrote to the president and said, let there be a referendum so that the people decide. We are not a party that is going to impose its will on the people. On this issue, we said, let the people decide because it's such a contentious issue. But the people um, um, currently now, one person was saying to me, we agree with your sentiment as the ATM on the question of the death penalty because there is a death penalty in our country. If, if 85 people are murdered on a daily basis, there is a death penalty. However, it's a death penalty for law-abiding innocent um, um, people. The people who do not want the, the, the constitution to be enabled to have the formal death penalty, it is people who are protecting the, the, the criminals who are killing people. In our country, we've got people who are called hitmen. Their sole purpose of making a living is by the taking of life of other people who don't agree with that sentiment as a party. We believe that we need to be very harsh when it comes to crime. And it is not something that we're saying it does not come by the influence on, um, on the structure of the economy, because we know that unemployment and poverty um, um, it, it, it does influence to a certain degree on our crime levels. So that is why I was saying deal with this unemployment and poverty. But for these cases whereby it is pure criminality, be very harsh um, and firm on the question of dealing with crime. Yeah, I suppose the danger is that uh, you then have a death penalty, but it will only be poor people that will hang because the rich people will do the Stalingrad uh, defense uh, lawyers and lawyers and lawyers and never get anywhere near the gallows. No, not at all. That is why when it comes to our proposal on the death penalty, like we said, that is extenuating circumstances. Um, and again, it's not going to be a case whereby 
the person might have done it or not done it, but it must be a case whereby there's overwhelming evidence that this person has committed this crime. Now, that is why we're saying that when the question of the death penalty, if a high court um, sentences a group of people or a person um, to the death penalty, there must be an automatic review to the Supreme Court of Appeal to make sure that even the poor people are able to receive um, you know, um, an opportunity to appeal their sentence and that um, you know, it could be um, ventilated in, in the higher courts to avoid a case whereby, like I'm saying, that only the, rich, um, the poor will be, um, um, you know, will be um, sentenced to the death penalty and the rich will be, um, 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 will, will be protected. That is a mechanism, amongst others, that we're introducing as a, as, a, as a means of trying to deal with that particular concern. Now, I know you, um, you've mentioned corruption, and uh, certainly you have received some uh, fame for your... Uh, the way that you have uh, continued to keep the Pala Pala case going in Parliament, right? I know that uh, you've taken on the public protector. Um, you must have uh, 200 and something, 240 odd people staring at you, uh, not being very fond of what you have to say on Pala Pala. Where's the, what's going to happen there? Yeah, so we, um, there's a high court challenge that uh, we submitted um, immediately after the vote that was done in Parliament um, on the um, on the Section 89 report, um, because we're of the view that Parliament failed in its oversight mandate, because Section 42 3 of the Constitution forces Parliament to scrutinise the actions of the executive. Now Parliament can't now take the responsibility and say um, the SARS, the Reserve Bank, the Public Protector are going to do what the constitution designates to parliament on what needs to be done. So that is the one part of the challenge. We've taken the report on Palapala by the public protector um, um, on review because we believe that it is fundamentally flawed. It has a narrow approach when it comes to um, the question of the abuse of power, particularly because a head of state wields so much power. Therefore, when you are a public protector and you're examining the actions of the head of state, you need to have an open mind when it comes to abuse of power and not have a narrow mind um, like what the public protector did, because in some of the instances, for example, the question of paid work, she wants to limit the question, um, the principle of paid work as to physically um, clock in at a certain mm. time, clock out at a, uh, at a certain time, whereby paid work, in our view, once you give your mental effort um, into something, that could be under, that should be understood as paid work, because by his own affidavit as a, as a president, the person that was dealing with the farm, managing the farm, got an instruction by the president to say there's going to be a buyer, please give him this, um, 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 these animals or these are the animals, take the money from, place, um, from the safe and place it here. That is a person that is giving his mental effort into running the business. Whereas the constitution, when it comes to protecting um, you know, um, um, public representatives or members of cabinet, it is to avoid a case whereby you've got a president that is supposed to be focusing on um, creating um, a better life for the citizen and resolving the problems of our country, but at the same time is mentally focused on his own dealings. That is why a president receives so much benefits. They've got a salary for life. It is so that you don't have to worry about the, your, your income after you are no longer president. But in this case, Mr. Ramaphosa, he's in his own affidavit, in his own um, you know, statements, he was mentally involved in terms of the running of the business. So that is why, in our view, the public protector was narrow. We need to have an investigation that is brought in that regard. Now, that's great. But the question that I must put to you is, is this about Cyril Ramaphosa? Because you, sitting across from you uh, in Parliament or at least half a dozen other people that have been found guilty of corruption, Zizi Kordwa, Gwedi Matashe, all these people at you know, Zonda Commission proved that they have done things that uh, should at least, at very least, expel them from Parliament. Yeah. Uh, what has been, uh, have you not had the opportunity to take up those cases, or where do we sit with that kind of corruption? Yeah, you know, we've been very vocal to say the president has got the powers to appoint ministers or remove ministers from cabinet. The first thing that you should have done after he instituted or his party instituted a state capture commission inquiry, which spent so much money 
and, and the outcomes is that some of these ministers, like you've mentioned, were involved in wrongdoing. The president should, be, should have been the one that is removing them from cabinet because it will have given a, a message to the people to say the president, because cabinet um, is a cabinet that is appointed by the president. So by the failure of the ANC president now to remove the people that have been implicated, that is something that is wrong. Now, when it comes to, again, in parliament, we've been um, very vocal, a part of the parliament process to say parliament must on its own find time and space to implement and discuss the implementation of the recommendations of the Zondo Commission, including the questions of how Parliament could be more, made to be more effective on its oversight role, and at the same time, Parliament um, actually deal with the members of Parliament, because there are members of Parliament that are not in Cabinet, that should be dealt with by the Parliament processes, like your Ethics Committee, your Rules Committee. So we've been at the forefront pushing for those um, cases to be heard by Parliament, on the question of the cabinet, we've been making a voice to say the president president can't act as if the Zondo Commission of Inquiry did not implicate the very people that he has appointed in cabinet. Okay, so as we're running out of time, I just want to uh, touch on the forthcoming election yeah. and uh, the African transformation movement, your prospects. Do you think that uh, that you're in line to do better this time than uh, than last time? Are you feeling quite uh, positive about the election? Very, very positive. Um, precisely because we've offered a new type of politics in our country. That is why, if you observe of our, our debates in parliament, we're not debating in terms of calling people names, insulting people, and doing everything that defines no our gimmicks. politics. No gimmicks, whatever. We are focused on saying what is a problem, what is a consequence as a result of the problem, but most importantly, what is the solution? That is why any three-minute video of us debating in Parliament, you will never um, reach um, three minutes without listening um, um, and being exposed to the solutions. We've managed to deal with the bread and butter issues. I remember in 2019, where the forefront calling for the government to transform the township economy because the township economy, as some reports is saying, more than 86% of the township rural economy in Northwest is in the hands of foreigners. And you can't have a space because the township and rural economy, it is whereby South Africans are trading for survival. Now, you can't have a case whereby the government is not protecting people who are so vulnerable because they trade for survival and you allow a space for foreigners who are funded by some of um, their, their countries, who are funded by some um, organizations to come set up shops in our country. We're very vocal on that. We're very vocal on saying um, there needs to be prioritization of South Africans in the job market because there are some sectors like your hospitality industry, your, um, your, your, your farms, whereby you seem that there's a displacement of South Africans in the economy. We took the fight to the Minister of Employment and Labor and Home Affairs, and some of the actions that have been taken by some of these ministers is a result of the pressure that we put. So in light of our contributions in Parliament for the past five years, we're very positive that majority of South African citizens are going to vote for ATM because a vote for the ATM is a vote for the interest of the marginalized South Africans wants to live in a better country, transformed um, uh, with a transformed economy, a safer country, and a country by the state capacity to deal with all of the crises that we have in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, we've all seen the pictures of our parliamentarians sleeping during parliament. I can guarantee you that Voya Zangula, Zangula does not sleep during parliament. I think that he keeps a lot of people awake. I think that they would... Uh, sleep a lot easier if he wasn't there in Parliament. If you are looking for a, another option for the general election 2024, consider the African transformation movement. You've heard the case here from Voya, very compelling. Voya Zungula, thank you so much for coming on to the State of the Nation. It's been great. We're going to get you back on because we've got a lot more to talk about. Thank you so much for joining us. It's only a pleasure and I look forward to coming back. Perfect. Well, to everybody else that has joined us, thank you so much for joining us in the State of the Nation. Subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time. Thank you.